an increasingly remote world has led to an increasingly remote workforce, which has opened the door for global, global diversity and for business to, to expand or initiate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Welcome to Getting DE&I Started, Five Proven Steps for a Successful Launch, a 30-minute webinar that will tap into the expertise of three people who are boots on the ground when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. I'm Jim Genia, editor of boldbusiness.com. And before I introduce the panel of experts, uh, let me get a little housekeeping out of the way. First and foremost is that there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. So put your questions in the chat function uh, and I will ask them for you. Um, the other issue I want to touch on is that this, the video of this webinar will be posted in its entirety on boldbusiness.com later this week in case you wanna listen to it again. So let's get to our experts. Uh, Ed Kopko is the CEO of Bold Business and for over two decades, Ed has helmed global companies and has been a big proponent of global diversity during that time. Pamela McElvain, CEO of Diversity MBA Media, um, helms a national brand that helps businesses iron out de and strategies. She is an expert on the topic. Finally, there's Tina Ragland, uh, enterprise leader for DEI and learning development at Pacific Life. Tina has firsthand experience implementing DEI programs. Um, Ed, can you take it away? Okay, thanks, Jim. So today, what we were uh, looking to accomplish, kind of, uh, kind of concisely for people, is to take advantage of our panel's insight into. What do companies who are starting, who are young in the journey or young at age and growing, how do they initiate and what are some of the proven steps to initiate a successful diversity, equity and inclusion movement inside your company that's successful? So here are the five steps. And we're gonna spend a few minutes on each of them. Uh, the first step is building passion and consensus then making a commitment, the company making a commitment, uh, communicating that vision, making a strategy and a vision that come alive. And then finally, how to stay on track when you're implementing and staying with it so it doesn't run out of steam. So we have, uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, both Tina and Pam here who have real world hands-on experience with this. And we're gonna launch this off about, so, um, Tina, I understand Pacific Life has gotten started with uh, their journey. Um, there is a difference uh, between building a passion for DEI e and I and making a consensus. Can you kind of uh, share something from your, your standpoint of why is building passion uh, for this movement important? Yeah, thanks, Ed. I'm really happy to be here with you and Pam today having this conversation, which is very important right now. Um, so we're a 150 plus year old organization and with an amazing culture. And when we thought about building DEI and our understanding our why and connecting that to our business, it was about understanding the passion that, that goes along with uh, incorporating clear actionable items and tying that to the ROI at the end of the day that supports our customers and our employees internally as well. So having that passion, it sustains the work that you're doing. Having the consensus is just a check on the box, a check of the box. So we want to make sure that we always have that passion to make sure that the work that we're doing and the actions that we're taking, we're sustaining that for a long term. Yeah. So Pam, help help me out a little bit here. You know, a, a lot of companies will just launch right into an initiative and they don't build that passion. Um, what are some of the stats and why is it important and why is it good for the company to go down this path? So before they make this commitment, they know their why. Share a few stats or some perspective that you have uh, as it relates to that. Thank you, Ed, and thank you for the opportunity um, to be here. And I would say absolutely, Tina. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. So, I mean, when you're thinking about launching and being a, developing any kind of strategy that you have in place, you always should think about your why first and what your purpose is. And in this changing world, in an environment where we're becoming a matrix world in terms of global diversity, equity, and inclusion, the why should be because we want to mirror the, the consumers that we serve, 
the um, the the constituents long term that will be part of our value propositions. So it is a business imperative if you want to, you know, have your products and services in different markets and, and have different groups and communities purchase them. And then the other part of being important, it's a, it's a human, it's a humanity, I believe, and a humanity issue in that you want to have respect of culture differences, multiple dimensions of all these uh, parts that represent people to be understood by every employee. So then that the diversity, equity, and inclusion component just becomes good for the company because now you're just respecting even a homogenous group, all the differences in cultural um, awarenesses and beautifications that they bring to the workplace. Sure. Okay. Um, Jim, step two. He did say stats. So uh, when it comes to making a commitment, so there's a process that companies go through in order to, you know, there's resources needed, there's goals that need to be done. Uh, Pam, I'm gonna start with you with a, with a question, the importance of making an assessment and finding out where the company is at the very first part of its journey. Can you talk about what an, ass an assessment is? What does it look like? Why is it important? Um, okay, thank you, Ed. So 98% of companies today right now have some type of initiative of larger companies, let me say, in, in diversity and equity. So they made some level of commitment. So what assessments do is give you an opportunity to, to understand and measure where you are. It, you can look at assessments as a way, um, some people call them audits, some people will call them um, um, reviews, but at the end of the day, what they are designed to do, the importance of it is to understand where you are so that you can design a plan in terms of where to go. And there are so many types of metrics out there. So from a fundamental standpoint, there's key performance indicators. Looking at the kind of um, metric that allows you to, 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 to help you uh, go down the road path. So an, I, an example of that would be, if you want to have an inclusion metric to measure engagement, you would look at the kind of activities that your organization maybe is celebrating, the number of people that it's impacting, and then you would do um, an evaluation to understand the rate of satisfaction and impact. And from, that's just one example, but from a, the, that kind of um, uh, plat initiative, types of initiatives that roll in together becomes a way to say, okay, now how do we move from you know, point A to point B? So you can't really, let me just say this, and I know this is, um, this is being really short, but there, there are probably 86 dimensions, 86 metrics that you can use to measure the effectiveness of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And at some level, they all have to move simultaneously. Um, not all, I mean, not um, in the same way, but you have to begin to impact one upon the other to, to have progress within your organization. So it is, it is critical, right, to any business strategy to have, an to have an assessment, to take in a review of where your organization is and then where you would like to go, where the desired outcome would be. And I would just say this, Ed, 78% um, of the companies that participate in our index are doing some level of assess, multiple, three to four assessments on an annual basis. And then 100% of them are at least doing the first level of identification where they are in, in terms of um, where they stand in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah. Well, um, Tina, uh, you had, have a phrase that I thought was uh, really insightful. The uh, which was meet the organization where they are, that prior to making this commitment, be, be, be able to meet, you know, understand where you are. Can you kind of share a little bit more of what you mean by that and the importance of that? Yeah, you know, I think my grandmother used to say, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going or where you've been. Um, so I, I really think that it's important that you don't try to bite off the entire apple. 
if you're not ready for that as an organization. So having partners like a PAM and a diversity MBA and uh, other partners to help you do some type of assessment, both looking at your diversity numbers, but also understanding where your employees are. So that engagement piece and level of commitment from your employees as well was really important, which was one step that we did. We took some time to sit back and really hear the voice of our employees to understand uh, where they were in the journey as well. So once you understand that, you know that what's the most important thing that you can make some meaningful impact. And I think that's the key is you want something, again, I can't stress enough that um, meaningful, actionable items that can be sustained and that can really make some real impact on, on this work. Yeah, you know, just in terms of an emphasis on this, the uh, I would suspect that a fair amount of young company CEOs are a little bit afraid of that assessment, all right? Because they're going to say, I don't want to look at it because I'm not doing that well with it. And it's going to be a bad report card on me and my leadership. Um, and their strongest leadership can be facing these facts and saying, hey, it's time to get going. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and part of that is, is being okay to sit in that space and acknowledging it so that you can move forward and, and make some progress. Yeah, so um, part of that step two, which sets up step three is creating an assessment. It is also um, then working with consultants and your leadership team to come up with some goals for yourself in terms of where are you going to go? So, and with that, when you have those goals, you are now ready to start to go talk to your company and share you know, the vision of where you want to take, you know, the business as a CEO or as a leadership team. So, um, Tina, you're you're right in the middle of this. How did how did that work for you? Yeah, at this point of life, or even in yeah. any other past uh, roles you've had. Yeah, sure. At, um, at Pacific Life, we really took some time to spend with the management committee, which is our CEO team, focused on our guiding principles. And those guiding principles as leaders, how are they going to show up? Because it takes leaders to really show up in this space and in and, and, and this journey uh, um, to see how they're modeling the behaviors that we want our employees to model as well. And so we worked on our guiding principles. Um, and then we talked about, well, why are we doing this? So what's our elevator speech? It shouldn't be a long drawn out thing. It should come from the heart. And um, our leaders also spent some time doing some unconscious bias training just themselves, just to sit in the space and uh, figure out just individually where they were. So really, so that it was um, a, a time where they can show up as leaders, authentic and really wanting to be successful along this journey. So, so Pam, Tina mentioned something which I, I thought was uh, is always good, that elevator speech. What are the two or three, um, you know, when you do your communication, you want your employees and your company to walk away with two or three key messages or goals, et cetera. Can you share anything that's kind of common of, you know, like what a goal might look like for D, E, and I when you're communicating that, that kind of charges the organization up? Uh, yeah, I mean, I one of the one of the things I was thinking about when when um, Tina mentioned, you know, the head. There's a head, heart, and the hand where you have the where you understand how important it is and where you feel it, and then the the hand is where you're actionable and you're engaged in it. So companies try to once the the leadership team has made that commitment, they try to illustrate that through actions. So they will embed the communication strategies and have the teams through the messaging, leveraging. So they will have a goal to let's leverage all of our current messaging platforms to have the clear strategy, um, make sure everyone in the organizations understand that. And so they'll they'll set that up, you know, for the net for for the next two quarters, uh, through all of their abilities to do that. And then they'll say we want to go and 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 meet with the em employees to make sure they heard what we said we were going to do. So then they'll set up quarterly, sometimes monthly. Um, what they call listening sessions, listening tours, and this is under the 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 helm of employee engagement. So within the uh, DEI commitment, while there are the um, 
the accountability measures, then you have to say, what are the initiatives and the actions and the activities that we're gonna do to move us toward, toward that goal? So right now you find that there's a lot of, a lot of energy around engaging the, the workforce, both from the community perspective, as well as internal. And, um, and companies look to, let's say over a four month period to have engaged their full workforce in either communication sessions that they've established quarterly town hall meetings that the CEOs and the leaders set up as well as fireside luncheons. And then, and then using diversity committees, they'll establish diversity committees um, anywhere from one to three to help. Um, model the messages. So those are a few types of the kinds of uh, initiatives that organizations will establish. Okay. So step four. So what are some tips to make, make it work? Um, Woo. <laughs> go ahead. You know what? You, oh, you, kick it off. you kick it off first, Pam. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know what, um, I'm doing this thing called new and they call it the psych tricks. And so I got really motivated by that to say, you know, they're, they're the DEI tricks, the diversity tricks to psych you up to wanting to be engaged, to wanting to be better, to leverage what you do every day in caring about your work, caring about your environment and caring about the people around you. So, you know, what are tips to successfully implement DNI initiatives? That is, how do you bring respect, your core values to life, right? Then that means being able to listen and to learn from what you hear. So when you really want to meet somewhere where they are and say, be authentic in the conversation, let's start respecting the honesty of what someone has to say in terms of what's important to them. So, so that, that's the first part of rolling out your initiatives. Believe that these are going to be integrated throughout the entire organization with the opportunity for everyone to be able to feed back into. And then I mean, you have to have, and Tina can talk about this because we talk about this, but you have to have a guide. You have to give people direction and opportunities to be able to measure and be engaged in it. Yeah, and so the, be the benefits of embracing, I was going to say, the benefits of embracing global diversity, it brings us all together worldwide. So, so Tina, I'm going to uh, uh, ask this question of you, even though Pam, I sure is going to want to add something afterwards, because data is something that Pam, it, you know, is very, very passionate about. But, you know, getting a piece of data or turning it into a quantifiable goal, you know, where you're shooting for something is a way to kind of help create a catalyst for people to say, hey, let's hit this target. Let's go for this. Can you share a little bit about how data comes in in the journey here when you start to go through your implementation process? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we've also done is we have six strategic pillars that we're focused on. And out of the six, we're making sure that we have meaningful goals and metrics that we can measure our success. And some of that we've been working with a couple of outside vendors and, and uh, Pam is certainly one of them that we've been partnering with um, just to understand what, what type of metrics we should be looking at in that space. So things like engagement um, from our sourcing strategy, whether it's community engagement or uh, philanthropy. So how do we measure the success in those areas? We have an employee inclusion council, enterprise inclusion council that we've put together and they also have goals and metrics to make sure that they're successful in the work that they're doing as well. So a lot of tied to the business um, to understand that ROI when it comes to our customer impact. And so we're looking at ways currently, how do we measure the real uh, bottom line from a customer perspective as well? All right, Pam, I'll give you another shot at this. Uh, you wanna add anything to, to Tina that I wanna add one, one small point. Yeah, I would just say, what does data do? Yes, and to what Tina just shared. Um, benchmarking allows to see where you are within your industry, even if you're a small business within your competitors. And it also provides a roadmap. And, and most importantly, it helps you recognize the milestones you have achieved, where you started and, and how you progressed along the way. 
Yeah. So one other point that uh, is up on the slide there, which is the benefits of embracing global diversity. One of the things that we've seen with uh, at Bold with some of our clients is that for many companies, they become uh, particularly younger companies. They're very geographically concentrated, sometimes only in one location primarily. Uh, they don't accomplish as many diverse dimensions uh, because, because of uh, some of these geographic uh, limitations. And I know, Pam, we've talked about this in other, uh, other ways, but you know, embracing that global world and saying, hey, I can uh, uh, look at a broader set of people uh, to uh, assist on, particularly on the diversity element. And as you said, it's your customers are global, your, uh, the world is global, and uh, the suppliers that you choose can help you get some of the more diversity in their dimension. So Bold has been helping some clients with that exact goal by helping bring some workforce solutions that enable that diversity. Um, Pam, anything you want to add as one last thing before we go to step five? Yeah, I'm just going to say, well said. I was just going to say, and, and being able to recognize even within a homogenous environment and a monolithic culture that providing the, uh, the opportunity for people to take their perspectives to a broader and global dimension um, is, is, is is the opportunity today. Mm -hmm. So going to implementation, one of the things that I think that, uh, that we have, that have to uh, do is the importance of uh, staying with it um, and potentially having consultants who are experts in the DE and I space. Tina, you mentioned that, you know, you guys have already started your journey. How do the consultants help you uh, in terms of staying on track and keeping that implementation going? Yeah, so I, I part of it is we don't have to be the experts in this space because there's some great partners out there that we can partner with. And what that's done for us is really um, have more resource available to us. And, you know, we're not out there trying to shuffle and figure it out on our own. And it saves a lot of time and energy and frustration. Um, and it, it prevents us from wanting to go forward too fast so that the consultants are helping us stay on track with our goals and what we're really trying to accomplish. Yeah, Pam? And I, I would say like, for example, um, with us working with Pacific Life and um, Tina laid out a strategy, I was able to, we were able to say, hey, Tina, here are the top 10 practices that you guys are executing and implementing within your industry. Um, she knew she was doing the diversity, equity, and inclusion work, but to know that it was, you know, among the top 10, you know, best things to do, we were able to provide those benchmark and those insights to her. But, but also, and that's part of, part of what benchmarking does is allows you to do that, but it also allows us to be real time and, and support uh, companies in a very custom and a very focused way in terms of achieving what's important for them and meeting them right where they are, not necessarily showing them the end of the road, but showing them the progression and what are some of the realities that they will encounter and, and be okay with um, going through those journeys. So yeah, I, I think like um, anything else, partnering, being strategic and realistic with the partner that you select and engage, making sure that they're not giving you too much, but they too are meeting you right where you are. Yeah, well, and I, I, I think I just want to put an exclamation point, Pam, to some of the work that you do, because, you know, uh, one of the things about um, uh, the, the whole DE&I movement, you know, as a, a comp CEO, we can pretty much go out into the public and find benchmarks of what our industry makes and how uh, how different kinds of metrics for our business are and how we rank against them. But the, in the DE&I space, there is no, you know, database, you know, that you can just look up or some kind of stock sheets that you can look at and say, hey, their market cap is bigger than my market cap and try to try to move you along. So your benchmarking is critical, you know, to the assistance of companies who are truly driven to not just be um, what I call legends in their own mind that always oh, improve from where we are, but hey, we want to be really 
really at the top of our industry and really make a difference in the world. And Tina, I think that's what you were, you were basically saying is the importance of, you know, how Pam and, uh, has helped in, in terms of uh, data. Absolutely. Absolutely. And part of that also has been, um, we were able to step back um, once we did put our final strategy in place and based on what Pam shared with us, how do we want to present this information out to our leaders and how do they share that with their teams? And, and Pam came in and actually had a round table with over a hundred of our uh, senior leaders within the organization to be able to talk about attaching the data and the importance of the benchmarking and the work that we've done uh, to their journey, as well as an individual business unit. Great. So Jim, I think we have a few questions. Um, maybe we can, we can go into that. We've got a few minutes left. Okay, um, we do have a few questions in the pipeline. Uh, and just a note to all the, the viewers, if you have any questions still, you can put them in the chat and I will relay them. So the first question, uh, where can you find resources to establish company benchmarks for hiring and representation for gender and race ethnicity? We are a government contractor with an engineer and cyber workforce. Diversity MBA. <laughs> yes, so we do. We have it by industry, and we probably have over 600 resources in terms of where, um, from over the benchmarking, where by state, um, where um, organizations are reaching out. So there's info at bowbusiness.com um, that you can reach out to if, if you want to know more. So we're able to also industry benchmark, which allows us to go deep and understand what's happening within um, within those areas. And I and I only thing I would say is, um, yes, we'll help you to know where to go, but don't be afraid to benchmark. Don't be afraid to understand where you are. Yeah, and, and just one other thing I'd like to offer to the, uh, the participants. If you want to send an email with a request, Pam has some data that she makes publicly available about some of the, you know, higher level natures of her work. Uh, it's much better, you know, you can get a much deeper dive if you, you go down the process and engage with, you know, your industry data, et cetera. But if you send an email to info at Bold Business, you will, uh, we will just request some data. Pam will forward on some of the uh, uh, bigger picture. Am I, am I speaking okay with that, Pam? You, yeah, I just thought about this. The diversity benchmarking index right now, yeah. it's right there on the website. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Okay. You can look at, go deep yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, Jim. Uh, next question. Uh, clearly an honest assessment is important. Can a business conduct this assessment on its own or is outside help required? I'm going to let you say that first, Tina. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that we could do it ourselves, but if an organization has that psychological safety, um, if you're benchmarking your, your employees but I, and, and doing that assessment, but I would actually recommend you seeking some support externally, especially if you're brand new on this journey, um, because you get the best practice, you know the right answers to get, and there's that distance between yourselves and the people that you're having the conversations with. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you, Tina, on that, as well as um, how realistic of a perspective do you want? And I, and I really think you can do your first, you know, your first assessment in terms of where you think you are. And then it's nothing like having someone else and help you understand where you really are. Well, I think uh, just to add something uh, uh, to this as well, is that I um, particularly for younger companies, I think more people understand the D in D, E, and I versus the E and I. So some of the conversations I've had with what kind of equity metrics would you first think of or inclusion metrics that you could think of to assess yourself, I think a fair amount of companies are going to scratch their head and may not know the questions to ask or the data to pull together, you know, so the outside, the outside help is, you know, um, it's kind of like saying, I don't need to go to a doctor because I'll ask myself three questions. And of course, <laughs> I can diagnose myself versus having someone who really understands, you know, the other dimensions much deeper. That's good, Ed. That's good. Well said. Well okay. said. Jim? Next question. 
Uh, what are typical obstacles a company might face when trying to implement DE&I programs? Well, I'm right in the middle of that. <laughs> um, so I, you won't get buy-in from everyone, right? And then you get frustrated just a little bit because you think you're making some inroads and taking the right steps, but you're not going to make everyone happy. And so you just have to be honest about where you want to stand as an organization, but you will not get buy-in from everyone. And that's internally and externally. You may have customers that might push against what you're trying to do, but you just have to start stand firm on your strategy and your goals and your mission of the work that you're doing. And recognize that that's where bias shows up. Mm -hmm. all types of biases. I mean, you have your perception, your perception bias, your affinity bias, your comfort by your in-group bias, which meaning I don't want to do anything separate from my group, the halo bias. I want to go with the rest of the group, right? So that's, that's why the bias training and awareness becomes very important early in the journey because it's change. Diversity, equity, and include, inclusion is a change management strategy. You're changing the culture of your organization. You're moving from one right pendulum to another. So that's, that's always going to be it with inherent resistance. Jim, do we have time for one more? Oh, uh, yes, we have time. Well, someone asked a logistics question if I'll be making the slides available. And the answer is yes. Uh, there will be a story on boldbusiness.com about this webinar, and it'll encompass the slides. Did you have something you want to add it or? No, no. Uh, only the other thing is, is that uh, uh, we are, Pam, uh, Diversity MBA and Bold are collaborating on a uh, learning series that goes deeper into the steps of DE&I that can be shared with the whole company. It will be, in a, uh, be made available to uh, participants and uh, stay tuned for that in the near future. All right. Well, I, I want, want to thank Tina and Ed and Pam for their time uh, and sharing their expertise. And I want to thank everyone uh, for tuning in. Uh, this was Getting DE&I Started, Five Proven Steps for a Successful Launch. Uh, if you need to connect with a partner uh, you know, to help you or just with questions, you can reach out to Ed at editboldbusiness.com or you can reach Pam. Uh, she has a contact page on her website. Uh, diversitymbamagazine.com. Pam, did you have an uh, email you want to plug that they can reach yeah, out to? Just, just put Pam in front of it. Pam at diversitymbamagazine.com. There you go. Uh, yeah. Tina, I don't, I don't know if you want people reaching out to you, but... <laughs> <laughs> they can reach out to me and I'll ask Tina. Pam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, again, thank everyone who tuned in, thank you and thank you to the experts. Thank you. Thank Kudos, you. Tina. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Well Thank done. Thank you guys. Well done. Thank right. you. Bye now. Bye-bye.